Next Sunday, we start another series of verses to memorize. You might think you haven't memorized this, but you've said it for how many months now? Twelve months. So it'll come back to you when you need it. But uh, we're going to do one more, one more Sunday with the Philippians passages, and uh, yeah. right, we let's say our verses together. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any vows and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done to strive for vain glory, but in holiness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. 
Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and is the glory of God the Father. Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out for your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do in his good pleasure. Let's sing our first hymn together, verse, uh, hymn 819, Constantly Abiding. Let's sing. Oh, my God. 
Please take your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 5. I'm going to read the first 10 verses this morning. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. And when the sheep shepherd, a chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Likewise, you younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, unto the mighty hand of God, that you may exalt you in due time. He may. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober. Vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. We'll stop right there. We look at this passage this morning. And um, let's go to prayer this morning. We'll continue to pray for Louise. She's not here with us, and uh, she has a, a constant battle with her arthritis and other things. Continue to pray for Jimmy and his kids, for Gerard and his health needs, and for Jared as he. Uh, Eventually um, moves to Florida. I think he comes up and back. Um, pray for Everton and Justine and their health needs. And uh, um, pray for Al and Janet and their family. And Carl and Paul and Kathy and uh, Denise. Pray for Matt and Mary and their families and ongoing health needs. And, um, and pray for their uh, grandson who's struggling and, and needs some help and uh, guidance, I guess, and the family needs help there. And pray for Keith and Elaine and uh, the, the health, ongoing health needs with Keith and Elaine has a cataracts appointment coming up and back appointments coming up. And so um, it's pretty much the norm for this congregation. You haven't fit into that yet, you call. But he'll catch you too. <laughs> and Chester, pray for him and his health concerns and needs. And uh, Chris um, Bell in England, uh, that the cancer has come back. And for Miriam over in, down in Brazil. And uh, continue to pray for her and for Ronnie, of course, in New Jersey. And for Stefan and Rebecca as they uh, perform their pre field ministries this year. And uh, with the goal of getting the language school, I forget when they said they were going to try to get there. Yeah, so, um, and for Jonathan and Hazuku as they minister in Japan, they have a prayer request. Janet?
I was going to say that we were willing we could spend the rest of the day with prayer requests. I was just thinking about the requests that I have personally have. It's like a filled volume of things, you know, personally and family-wise. All our kids, grandkids, you know. When you have grandchildren, you, as grandparents, normally you, you pray for them, for their future, their spouses, where the Lord will work with them. And, you know, that, that, that can consume you if you let it. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful for this opportunity to get together. And, um, we pray, Lord, that as we uh, enter, uh, get ready to uh, introduce a new year, that it can be a, a new opportunity for us as well, either personally or um, corporately, however you want to look at it, Father, that each one of us, including myself, uh, see uh, areas that need change. And, um, we want to grow closer to you, anticipating to be in your presence one day. And so we pray, Father, for our church family uh, with that matter, that uh, we would be uh, a significant witness in this area as a church. We pray for Louise, and um, she's hurt physically, and uh, I'm sure emotionally she has her days uh, missing Pastor Art, and that you would be with her. Uh, pray for Jimmy, and as he uh, tries to uh, encourage his children to go to church and uh, all the things that that entails, Father, that you would just uh, strengthen him and bless him. And for Gerard and his uh, best friend's parents, Father, that you would just uh, be with them. And uh, we pray for uh, Jared as he uh, goes back and forth to Florida, Lord, that you give him safety on the roads. And we pray for uh, Dylan and uh, uh, his uh, struggles, Father, that you would just open the opportunity for him to grow. And we pray for um, um, Al and Janet's family. We pray for uh, Kathy, Father, and her back, and for Carl, and for Paul, and for Dylan. Denise and for Matt and Mary's family and uh, we pray for that that whole situation for Scarlett and the family in Florida and for Keith and Elaine and their ongoing needs father and I pray for Keith's voice as he goes to for voice um, I wouldn't say lessons but um, <laughs> Pray for Chester and his ongoing uh, physical needs, and for Miriam and continue to bless her. She serves down in Brazil, and for um, Chris Bell, Father, and uh, his ongoing needs, and for uh, Stefan and Rebecca, that you would bless them as they serve you, and uh, that in your timing they would get to the field. And for Ronnie, be with her and uh, um, just um, help her to acclimate to where she's at and for Jonathan and Hazuku as well as they uh, serve in Japan. We're thankful for the moments that we have together and we just give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. All right, on the hymn we can sing, Jesus Shall Reign. 808. <laughs>
necessarily be there. And not necessarily an abnormal passage to pick for New Year's. I was thinking a theme for New Year's, something new, uh, something different. And uh, what I find a lot of times toward the end of the year, you start to reevaluate your life through your life this far. And uh, there's, a, there's always a good opportunity to detect ruts. You know what a rut is? Get your wheel stuck in it, and uh, you want to go that way, and the rut takes you this way sometimes. Habitual ruts, we get stuck in uh, some kind of uh, um, mental state that might not necessarily be um, a benefit to your Christian walk. And uh, so there, there, uh, there needs to be an examination, uh, I thought. And I thought, this is what I, I do. And I would suggest that um, it would be a help for each one of us as we consult this passage. Now, the context um, is uh, more pastoral. Matter of fact, uh, he's talking to pastors about what they should do and how they're supposed to do it. But I find within... Within the context, there's application for us as well. Uh, and I'm just a regular guy as well. I'm a pastor, but it still works for me because he deals with uh, some areas of life I think that would uh, benefit us. Um, the first thing we find is in verse 5 and 6. So if you take your Bibles, he, uh, and it doesn't necessarily, as soon as you read this, jump out of the page. But if you think about it for a while, uh, what I see is a necessity in verse 5 and 6 for us as believers to surrender to God's will. And I'm going to try to define that, you know, as, as we go on. Let me make sure I got everything that I need. Got it. Okay, because I was writing notes this morning. And I want to make sure I have it with me. <clears throat> Verse 5 says, uh, likewise, you know, you younger men. Now, this is after the admonition uh, to the um, pastors, the leaders. You know, uh, there's a possibility of a reward for faithfulness that doesn't fade away. Kind of like for all, most believers. But anyway, it says, the younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Now, the complex uh, understanding of elder has um, sometimes caused a misunderstanding of the usage. Elder, there are some churches that have an elder rule and multiple elders. And, uh, you know, there's an interchange of the word, uh, pastor, elder, whatever. It seems that Paul uses them interchangeably. But sometimes elder just means old person. You know, there is wisdom in, uh, you know, um, submitting yourself to someone that's been around a few times. You know, you've talked to people that went through the Depression. They have some valuable wisdom that would be uh, helpful in these days. You know, what do you do when the, circum cir circuit, the uh, supermarkets close and uh, there's uh, shortages of certain things? And uh, us. They're not hard, they're not easy to find these days, those people from the depression. No one here has gone through the depression. That doesn't mean you haven't been depressed, but the depression, you know, so let me make myself clear because all of us seem to linger on this, this uh, side of depression sometimes because of just the way the world is. Um, that's a choice that you can take. Um, I choose to try to avoid that as best as possible, even though my wife used to call me, and I don't know if still does, Eeyore. But um, I always see the dark side of everything, but that's kind of my nature. But anyway, let's talk about surrendering to the will of God. Uh, and it always begins with this idea of assuming the position of submission. Um, no one wants to submit to anything these days. Everybody wants to do their own thing. But uh, I think the correct biblical paradigm for the believer is to acknowledge that God is in complete control. So if you're going to submit to something, you might as well submit to Yahweh, God himself. 
Um, we live in a day when men are all seeking their own way. Uh, but the child of God who wants to please the Lord will learn to allow God to have a place or pre preeminence in their lives. And Colossians 1.18 was a verse that I was considering. Um, and I'll, let me read that for you. And you, you make the decision whether it's applicable for us. But I think it is. Colossians chapter 1 verse 18. I'll read it for you here. Uh, and he, that's the Lord Jesus, is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. So the Bible kind of echoes this concept of submission, of uh, uh, surrendering to God himself, acknowledging who Christ is in your life. You might be thinking, well, I do that. Well, the reality is, is a good test for you. If Christ is preeminent in your life, then you can turn around and then look at your life and it should reveal itself in action. If he's the most important thing, then everything you say and do will reflect that. And so this is, you know, an ongoing project for each one of us. Because if you know Christ is your Savior, there's a, there's a desire to please him. But then there's all sorts of various obstacles that we have to get around. Uh, most made by ourselves, but there are other obstacles that interfere with that. So, um, when we, uh, let me get back to the passage here before I start confusing myself. So we have assumed the uh, place of submission, and uh, it not only goes that far, but the, the, the uh, description of submission is given here in the uh, the same passage of verse 6. It says, um, Humble yourselves, therefore, unto the mighty hand of God, that you may exalt you in due time. So, likewise, you younger, submit yourselves to the elder. Yea, all of you should subject one to another, and be clothed in humility. For God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. So there's a lot more in that passage that you can develop. But... Um, Taking a humble pill isn't necessarily the most attractive thing to do. We all want to dominate things and uh, be, be ahead of everybody else. Uh, we're competitive in nature. Uh, but within a church setting, this concept of submission really is uh, beneficial to both parties. As you focus on others, others focus on you. There's a, a benefit for all of us. As far as our connection with Christ, we find ourselves praying for each other. I get this um, uh, notification every once in a while. If you're awake at 3 o'clock in the morning, you should be praying. How many of us wake up at 3, 4 o'clock in the morning? I do. And you lay there, sometimes listening to your spouse sing glorious songs, you know, um, nasal songs, <laughs> snore, you know. And, uh, my wife and I share. Well, I don't snore anymore because I have a CPAP machine, although, although I do kind of choke a little bit sometimes. But uh, when you're awake like that, uh, the best thing to do is to, uh, you know, pray. Because it's 3 o'clock there. It might be 3 o'clock in the afternoon somewhere else. Some other believer needs prayers. And uh, so I guess you have to really kind of evaluate the importance of your prayer lives as believers for the new year. You know, we can't do anything with the past, but there are some things we can start right in the beginning. Tomorrow, I think, is New Year's Day, right? Or New Year's Eve. Tonight's New Year's Eve, so tomorrow's a new year. 2024. What can we do differently to change not our own lives, but our church as well? Praying, I think, is the number one thing. We need to pray cons constantly and consistently and fervently. I think um, the humility comes a long way in it, because... If you're, if you're allowed godly humility to take place, then there's a desire to see God move in the lives of others as well. So, um, now, clothed in humility is a, is a first century picture of uh, assuming the place of slavery. Not the slavery from our human history, but the doulos ideology. Have you heard that before? Doulos is bond slave. That in the first century meant that as a slave, 
Um, and uh, you could have been in servitude because of debt of your family or whatever. Uh, there is, there's always a time limit there. And then because of the kindness of the person, you decide to stay with them. Today we would talk that way, but we use the words job. You know, you go to your work and you work for that person, except for the part where you move in at the end. Uh, you know, you uh, Keith worked for uh, whatever, airline food thing, and when he retired, he didn't say, now where can Elaine and I live? Do you have a compartment for us? That, that, that wouldn't work. So you gotta be careful with your illustrations, Chris, and especially don't talk to yourself when you're talking to others, but we find that. You assume the idea of slavery is there. So the concept, we have to go from a biblical position to know that a doulos means that I willingly want to serve the Lord. And I want to demonstrate that by staying close to him. That's what the passage really is kind of talking about. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. What a beautiful picture of not God squishing you with his hand, but John says he holds us in his hand. He protects us. Our salvation is in his hand. So it's a, it's a I would say, the normal gravi gravity toward being closer to him who loves us uh, for the new year. That requires us to look at our lives and say, now let me think, what gets in the way of my relationship to God? And then that's an individual thing you have to think about. Is it this, 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 and this? And how can I change it so that God takes preeminence in it. A lot of times the activities you could do that could get in the way, you could incorporate in your relationship to God and have let him have his way with you in that area. I know I'm being abstract because I really can't pick any one thing, but certainly things get in the way of life. There's a third thing, and it's, it's always the uh, caveat of everything that God gives us. Because he gives us everything there for us, but there's a responsibility on our side. We have to accept it. Meaning, if we can learn the way of humility, then the Lord will lift us up in his own way. As long as we seek to promote ourselves, we never really amount to much for the glory of God. That's a different ideology altogether, but it blends in with us. We, You might not even be thinking this, but... Um, there is that, <coughs> excuse me, problem with wanting to be there first in the limelight uh, where God uh, wants us to just trust him and he'll use us when he needs us. I remember in high school playing football, there was a moment there at the time where I was, was not a first stringer, but I didn't want to go out either. I wanted to be there. But I, the last thing I wanted to hear is, oh, get out there. Because I panic, you know. Get out where? What am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to know all these plays I never memorized because I've never first, you know, there's a struggle there. But for the believer, if we're preparing ourselves on a daily basis to be representing him, then we'll be ready when he calls us. And he'll call us when we're ready. Uh, it falls into that whole category of Ephesians that we studied. He's working on us. We're his workmanship. And, uh, you know, it's something that uh, is an individual thing. But there's a, an element of cooperation on our part as well, that we accept this, his sovereignty. You know, as long as we seek to promote ourselves, we're going to have problems. You know, the, God has to come first in everything. Okay, number two. Oh, there's nothing up there. Is there? <laughs> Verse 7. I think this is uh, the natural um, progression here for us as believers because this is something I think that's most common with us. Um, the the uh, writer says, casting all your care upon him for he cares for you. All your anxiety on him because he cares for us. So that's a that's a blanket statement. So what, what basically he's saying is to send your worry to God makes sense to me, you know, uh, easier said than done is basically what we're looking at. Um, so uh, the element of sending is uh, first conclusively casting. That verb refers to the act of throwing or casting something away. 
It's in a form that refers to a one-time deal. So casting a pole isn't a good example because what do you usually do when you cast it with a pole? You reel it back in. That's not what God is telling us to do. He's telling us to cast it away without it coming back to us. So that requires us uh, an elevation of our understanding of who God and his capabilities are. Is he able to take this anxiety that you have and take it off of your shoulders? The Bible says he is. And he wants to. Uh, the reality is, even though you pray about it, it seems to still hold you down or weight you down. And uh, so casting all your care upon him for he cares for you is uh, one element in, in, a, in an exercise that requires uh, determination on a regular basis. I don't know how you do it, but personally, when something is really bothering me, I, I'm throwing it at them all the time. It seems to bounce back, but I just throw it back until it doesn't come back. You know, if it's... If it's weighing heavy on you, you just got to give it to him. With that, though, there has to be the willingness to accept the outcome of that. That doesn't negate you from the responsibility of having this problem or this. Sometimes anxiety is worrying about something you can never really fix. You ever run into people who are like, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, you know? Um, I've seen a cartoon where a, a little chicken gets hit with an acorn, thinks the sky is falling. You know, and actually does in the cartoon, but it was actually an alien. But never mind. But you can't, you can't worry. The Bible kind of referenced the idea that, you know, who among you can really change your height or change something about you? There are some things that are set in stone. Um, worrying about the economy, worrying about. Uh, other things uh, is a natural thing that we deal with, but there is an avenue that we can take to alleviate the frustration of the problem that we're facing. And that's just giving it to him. Understanding who he is. Hebrews reminds us that he's the good high priest. Why? Because he really cares. And he can relate to us. Now you might be thinking, and you won't say it out loud, but you might be thinking this. I've tried it. It doesn't work. And I'll be honest with you, there's some things that have bothered me in the past that I've tried to give the Lord, and it, I couldn't. It, it just kept coming back, you know. And uh, uh, then what do you do? Well, the, what, I, what I find from the passage here is the, the word casting means on a continuous basis. It's almost like a, 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 a boomerang effect. You just keep throwing it back. Throwing it back with the, uh, the understanding that uh, him dealing with it uh, should relieve the, the worry about the situation because he's the only one you really can turn to. If you think about it, if you have a problem, uh, you, you know, your, uh, your gastrics don't work, don't come to me. I don't know what to do. Go see a doctor of gastrics, whatever that is. I'm showing my ignorance here, not uh, using the proper terminology, but um, you know, we, we understand that when we have a problem, we, we can go to an expert to fix it. But really, when you think about it, God is the great physician. God is the great economist. God is the creator of all things. And so when we're faced with anxiety about something, uh, if he says to, he'll take it, then we have to take it at face value. So um, it's conclusively, it's completely. And uh, notice how much uh, or our burden we are supposed to Give. Now, that sounded like broken English, so let me say this again. Casting uh, is a continuous thing. The next thing that's described is all. Not just the hard parts, but everything. Don't reserve something for you to chew on. Give it all to him. Uh, there is, uh, um, and I don't think it's a mental problem, but there is um, a love for anxiety in some people. They have to be worried about something. You run into somebody like that? It's just their thing. You know, um, 
They're worried about that asteroid that's coming to the earth. Well, what asteroid are you talking about? Uh, I read in the Bible, wormwood. It's coming. I said, you're right, but you're not going to be there. What do you mean? Well, if you're a Christian, you're going to be raptured out of the earth. So what are you worried about? You know, so, and I'm not mentioning names, but we all have met folks like that, and they just kind of relish in the worry. If they're not worried, they feel like there's something wrong with themselves. You know, uh, hey, that's just the way some people are. But when we look at the scriptures, we find that if we're, we have anxiety, we're to give it all to him, not reserve anything for ourselves completely. So conclusively, casting completely, that's everything, all, all the care. And uh, we're not, not so much as to keep even the smallest part of a burden to ourselves. Uh, we're told to give it all to him. And then with confidence, and I think this is the, uh, the uh, cream of the crop part of it, um, how we can do this. Uh, for he cares for you. You ever talk to someone who could care less? You know, you got a problem with your computer, and you're like, yeah, yeah, okay, what, 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 what'd you say? You know, you're just, they're just on a different wavelength. And they don't really care, they're probably thinking, what a whiner, here we go again. But God is different. God understands, knows already, and is already working in your lives. So uh, our acknowledgement is that we are talking to the right person. God who cares for us. So casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Uh, that's an excellent uh, way to begin the year, to let it go. Don't worry about what's going to happen next. You know, we get to the point where we're getting to the, we try to know what we're going to do. And a lot of you, you're retired. So you're retired, and then you find yourself working just as hard as you were when you weren't retired. And you think, well, what did I work all my life for to work again? And then you retire again. How many times have you retired, Jimmy? Probably 15. Yes. <laughs> Keith is retired. No, he's not. Yes, he is. No, he's not. Well, even God's confused. It's like, is he working or not? <laughs> so, this is the way we are, you know, and we have to deal with it. A lot of times the things that we put on ourselves are contribute to this whole anxiety. But there is one thing we can do is we can give it to him with confidence. Hebrews 4.15 describes that, you know, with absolute confidence he cares about us. And when we are burdened, he touches the heart um, when we are burdened, it touches the heart of God and he's moved on our behalf. I'd like to give you that, but you won't understand. Well, the verb is uh, present tense active voice indicative mode, so it doesn't mean much to you. But to someone looking into the Greek, it really so solidifies the, the idea that this is, this is something that we, is tangible for us to understand that God is never going to say, look, I'm busy, call me back later. He's always going to be there for you immediately. And that gives us the confidence to know. And eventually that incorporates in our lives. And that's why when something comes up, most of us will say, well, let's pray about this. You know, I'll pray for you. I pray for unsaved people. They look at me like, what? They don't understand it. It doesn't really matter to me. I'll pray for them and their families. And even if they're not even believers, I believe that. A lot of times God works in the hearts of others and, and uh, does uh, great things uh, for his name's sake. So there's three things, and here's the last one. Uh, verse 8 and 9. And don't misunderstand this because it doesn't really say what you might be thinking it says. It says, be sober. Okay. That's it. No more coming to church. Unsober. You know, it's like, okay, that's not what it means there. But it does have a lot of a weight to it. Um, be sober in your thinking, clear thoughts, sober in your ability. Um, so this is the strength in your walk with God part of it. Uh, the phrase sober and villain means that we need to get serious about things, especially where the devil is concerned. Who do you think wants to get your life in the pits anyway? Uh, who do you think is actively interested in seeing you miserable? You know, um, this is something that we have to face. So understanding what's behind all this will help us uh, to avoid the things. So in this passage, it says be vigilant because. So that answers why we're supposed to walk like this. The adversary, the devil, he's like a roaring lion. 
He, he walks around looking for someone to devour. So there's an element of seriousness about the devil's reality. In our society today, in, in Arkansas or Oklahoma, in the government's building there, they have an altar to Satan. Big goat head. You've got to see the news. Some um, um, ex-military seal was in there and just destroyed the whole thing. He said, this is wrong. He got arrested on a fourth uh, degree, whatever, and got off for it. But they, they put it back up in our, in our government, you know. They don't want the Ten Commandments, but they have a statue of Satan there. Doesn't make much sense. But that's where we live. But um, the devil's hope is that people will kind of just fluff it off, you know. And you have uh, various groups that uh, will say Satan is just evil or they'll say that he doesn't even exist it's in the minds of uh, human people human beings uh, but uh, the verse refers to a being that uh, most of the world doesn't believe in today however just in case there is any confusion in your mind the devil's real jesus believed in him the bible believed in him uh, god believed in him therefore he must be real god created him we read this in genesis and other parts of the scripture so the devil's there. Um, be serious about his ferocity as well. Uh, the devil is compared to a roaring lion. Lions are forceful. This is I got out of a book, so take it with a grain of salt. They're 14 to 21 times stronger than a man. No one here wants to fight a lion, right? Satan is far stronger than we are as well. We cannot fight him on our own. Even Michael the Archangel would fight the devil in Jude chapter 9. Um, lions are ferocious. A mature lion can consume the 30% of his own body weight in one sitting. You, you might be thinking, well, those facts are kind of useless, but it kind of gives us a parallel of uh, Satan and his, his uh, uh, unwillingness to quit. Lions are fearful as well. And, uh, you know, his roar can be here five miles away. And... Uh, uh, so the last part, be serious about um, the devil's um, ability to worm his way in. Uh, Satan doesn't want to walk around with a pitchfork and tails. He wants to be a member of the church. Matter of fact, he wants to be a pastor. You know, so he wants to infiltrate the church. And so we have to be always constantly aware of, uh, of what the scripture says and what God expects of the church. And... Uh, I think the last thing I want to give you is found in verse 10. And it's not the most important, but it's, it, all of these are important, I think. is um, Verse 10 says, But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that which you have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle. So what, uh, what the passage is telling us is the, uh, to be uh, willing to see the work of God continue, to be willing to be a part of God's work here at Comac. Um, the grace we now enjoy while we journey through those, these difficult days, uh, while we fight the devil day by day, uh, God's grace is sufficient for us. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, I think, is that verse. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there is this idea that uh, the difficulties in life aren't necessarily going to be removed by the Savior, uh, but God strengthens us through these odd times. Um, the grief we must endure is found in verse 10 there. Uh, all of these things that we uh, go through, suffer a little while, will uh, perfect us, uh, complete us, establish us, and strengthen us, and actually settle us in our walk, in our our uh, attempt to uh, serve him in this world at this time. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to keep myself from going abstract because the, the application is very important for us to understand that in our time here at Comac, this little tiny church, we, we have the choice of even being insignificant and just keeping our doors closed or to look elsewhere, looking for ways to reach out as a small church here in the community. As the world gets worse, um, people aren't necessarily going to come to church. Did you notice that? 
when Desert Storm hit, people were in churches, but after that, it just kind of petered off. Oh, well, that's the way the world is. So we have to be the ones that are prepared and ready to give an answer to the hope that lies within us. That's the whole total concept that we want to try to get across this morning for the new year. Being ready to have the answer. Not necessarily the philosophical understanding of everything, but what does God expect from us? What does God have for us as believers? What does it have uh, that we can share with others that they can benefit from? And of course, that's the gospel message. So, if there's any um, confusion in your life, this is an opportunity for you to uh, think about what I'm going to say here. Because uh, this little, I, it's not a mantra, it's actually a hymn. But, uh, and uh, the, I think it's a chorus too, but I don't hit right down the hymn, so you guess it for me. It says, am I surrendering my will to God? Am I sending my worries to God? Am I strengthening my walk with God? Am I seeing the work of God? It's a nice mantra to kind of remind yourself. In my daily walk, first, am I surrendering to the will of God? Or am I resisting it? Every time you feel like you need to read the Bible or you do something else, that's an element of resist. So the, the, the believer should gravitate to the Word of God and then think, am I, am I dealing with the things that are dealing with me properly, biblically? Am I giving it to God? Am I, uh, is my walk strengthening? Uh, am I standing taller on the scriptures? And then lastly, am I seeing the work of God? Now you can say, uh, there is a change in my life. Can you look at your life and say, I see something different in my life than I did in the past. There is a new desire to serve him. I get excited when I think about, there's going to be a time, a moment in my life where things are going to go out. My lights are going to turn off. I'm going to blink. And all of a sudden I'm going to be somewhere else. Somewhere better. It's exciting. There's an element of wonder there. You know, what's it going to be like in heaven? And I'm going to wait, Lord, where's my mansion? It's right there. Oh, the refrigerator box. Great. <laughs> <laughs> the, the expectations are going to be something to, I don't know. We have another year to serve him, basically, is what the scripture tells us. We can do one of two things. We can serve him, resist him. And then deal with uh, his discipline in our lives. I choose to obey God's word and just put him first. And uh, whatever comes my way, I know that he's able and capable of providing for me. How about you guys? So whatever comes our way, whoever is the president, who cares? God's in complete control. And we'll just trust him for uh, our needs and uh, hope that he'll take us home this year in the rapture. If not, we'll... We'll get there one day. Let's pray together. Father, we're thankful for this opportunity. We're thankful, Father, that um, even though life gets tough, it doesn't necessarily have to uh, detract from our relationship to you. Matter of fact, it should help and strengthen us as we uh, cry out to you for help and trust. And we pray for our families. Some are going through some very difficult times. And uh, we pray for our grandchildren who are struggling uh, with a world that has uh, gone kind of upside down. And we pray for them, Father. Give us wisdom to uh, be able to help other people and uh, to share the godly wisdom that we glean from your word, Father. We just give you the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's sing one more hymn together. Thank you. 
opportunities to share the love of Christ with others, and we're thankful for all things. Pray for our country, pray for Israel, Lord, and all the believers throughout the world that are suffering because of uh, oppression and uh, things like that. Father, you give them grace, and we just give you the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. 